but non-judgmentalness is huge. Um, and probably one of the hardest for us to deal with in the church, because remember, when we bit an apple that said we know the difference between good and evil, like we have the knowledge of good and evil, we took the knowledge of what we, in our broken state, decide are good. And what we decide is good is what's best for me. Like that fundamentally is how we define good, which is not necessarily what God said is good, which is where we get into a lot of trouble defining behavior and things that we think are good and we judge everything else as bad. And so it's one of like the most horrendous consequences, um, but somehow we use a lot of scriptures to say, oh no, we're allowed to sit in the seat. We should be looking at Christian brothers and sisters that spiritually we are connected to and challenge them on things where they're headed to go over a cliff as a Christian. Like, I am my brother's keeper in that sense. That's very different than judging. You didn't give up this, so you're not a Christian, or, you know, um, which actually puts a performance metric on the church, on all of us, which actually stops people from coming in. You know, all the times we've heard people say, um, I'm not a Christian and I don't want to be a Christian yet because I have all these things I have to change before. I mean, that's horrible. You know, if we don't see Jesus say, come how you are, um, it's an incredible example. And so that piece is really, really hard. And so as a result, we've lost a lot, lost a lot of credibility to just go, I'm going to understand for the purpose of calling forth your spiritual identity and exhorting you and walking alongside you versus making some judgment about your behavior and then deciding I have the answers and telling you how to resolve that, okay? So non-judgmental, um, a true, really safe person, you can come and tell them anything. You know, I just murdered a dog on the way to your office. I feel terrible about it. And they're going to go, yeah, we don't quite understand that, but let's kind of walk through what's happening here, you know. And I use a story. Um, so I taught in an MBA program for, oh gosh, I guess almost 18 years. And helped develop a master in healthcare program within the MBA program, which I taught, it ended up, I think I was, I taught the entire cohort of thir 12 of 13 classes because I taught them first, I was their advisor, the second professor they had was awful, and they went to the school and said they only wanted me teaching their classes, and I told them and the school that's really unhealthy, um, but I taught all their classes. So I got very, very close to this group of people um, you know, and so two days, you know, like the last two days of class before graduation, um, on a Saturday, four hour class, one of my kind of star students doesn't show up for class. And this gentleman, he was a drug and alcohol counselor. He was an elder in his church, very involved in his church. Um, you know, profess this love of the Lord. Now, not all of my students were Christians, but that's kind of who he was. And he doesn't show up for class. And, uh, and it was just really weird because he didn't text me or anything and he was always great at communication. And then, you know, he shows up for our final class celebration and uh, like Saturday is gonna be graduation. Thursday night, my husband and I are laying in bed and the news is on and I see my student, Anton, going across the screen in an orange jumpsuit. He is, you know, has all the chains on. And I start to hear about one of the most horrible, disgusting murders ever, premeditated. And, um, and I'm looking at going, what in the world? Like, and so it was just nasty. And so... But my husband knew me, this wasn't Steve, it was my first husband, and he says to me, you are not going to see him. Like, I know you, you are not going to see him. I said, oh yeah, I am. And he's like, he just murdered somebody, like went and bought ice picks. I mean, he did, it wasn't just that he even went and premeditated murder, he tortured her and then took her in her car down to Philadelphia, which is why he missed my class, and sent the car caught it on fire, sent the car into the river to cover up what he did. Okay, so this is not like somebody you're going, yeah, let's go run around and pal around with, right? 
And so my very protective husband was like, they're not going. And I said, I have to see them once. I said, if they will let me visit, and then I'm gonna work with some of my friends who do pastoral ministry who are men to keep up with them. Of course, you know, he's either gonna get the death sentence or he's gonna be on death row. He actually is on death row. But I said, you know what I believe, that we all are capable of horrific stuff. And we don't always understand what, how somebody's brokenness shows up. Like we don't really get, if you guys list, listed all your sins, I would look and go, well, I don't even understand some of that, right? But when I listed mine, you wouldn't understand mine either, right? And somehow we develop our list of sins is better sometimes and we would never stoop that low. We are capable of stooping extremely low. And it is only by the grace of God and the journey that we're on that hopefully we get saved from some of the more atrocious things we could do. And some of us have done really atrocious things. I certainly have in my life. And so for me, the important part is the fact that he did all that, but he professes a love of Jesus. He is still my brother in the Lord. His spiritual identity, you know, what he has to do with God about this, I don't really know how you repent from this and what all that looks like. But he needs to be reminded that even if he is in jail for the rest of his life, don't let Satan tell him what you did is so horrific you can never serve God or never love God. Because you have a different kind. Like God is going to use this. He promises to use everything. And you could have a fantastic ministry in prison. You've got to repent. You have to do the healing that needs to come with it. But your story could still change other people's lives for eternity. And so if we don't sit in a seat that people can tell us the worst thing they ever did and we can't look at people and say, I love you, I'm here to walk with you, I don't necessarily understand that because I think it's, it's fair to call that out. We have a, Steve and I have a friend who was heavily involved in porn and we were um, working with him and the one day he had something so horrific, he actually drew it on this piece of paper and then he hid it and he said, I can't speak this out loud, but I want you guys to see it. And I'm reading it on this piece of paper, like trying to let, not let my face be in complete shock because I didn't even realize some of the things existed. So I'm trying to understand and I'm trying to not react because he is, he is living in so much shame. He is expecting me to shame him, right? And so my goal was to, you know, as a human being, I can't say, oh yeah, that's not bad or I fully get it. It is okay for me to say, hey, you need to know I love you, I'm here to walk through. If I listed all my crap, like you'd probably have some questions and not understand. I'm not sure I understand this, but I understand the problem of the sin nature and we are here to walk through this. We, believe, we have hope you know, for this and we're here to walk with you. And that actually to me is really the crux of a safe person. Um, and so many times we come in to fix people or to go, oh yeah, that's really bad, which keeps more shame on them and keeps people from not telling. But what if we were a church where people could tell all and we were safe. And when they tell it and bring it into the light, authentically, Jesus would walk in and pretty much turn their life around. Because, you know, it's even hindering their relationship with God that, you know, I don't measure up. Like, God's not going to want a part of me. But no, this person graciously received me representing God. There's a path for me. So when, when we talk about non-judgmental, it's not how we throw that around. Well, people shouldn't be judgy. Yeah, we're all judgy. You know, that is part of the transformational journey, the judgment still. I walk down campus sometimes and I'll see a new guest coming and you guys probably have seen them too, if you're willing to admit. Um, I look and go, what in God's green earth is going on with that person? And I, I hope that I can get to my office before I even have to deal with whatever's going on there because, oh my goodness, you know. So that's going on in my head. And I immediately have to take the thought captive and say, uh, Lord, I, here I am again. I need your eyes to see, your heart to feel, you know, your ears to hear because I'm kind of going, run away, you know. 
it ends up I'm called to generally minister in some way to that person and be in relationship, and I never see them like that person again. I see them through God's eyes. But that's part of transforming. Like, just let's acknowledge we tend to go to judgment of things we don't understand very, very quickly. And so it is a part of our nature. A lot of these other things, you know, listens actively, holds um, confidence, is accepting, caring, loving, um, really important. The one that uh, can be really, really hard and, and a struggle for us to build into the culture when we switched to this new model, um, when, we, when I got the mission and we were switching, um, and you'll hear this, we had a ministry uh, that actually, I met them at CityGate in San Antonio, they're doing work, street ministry in Dallas, and we talked, we had lunch at the, there, and they actually flew out to see what we were doing and to learn a lot more. But they said, it is so hard for us to really see people because our whole, what we're trying to do is to get people saved. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much the church. We don't really care about the person. We care about, oh, we chalk one more up to heaven and then we kind of let them be. I mean, the state of American evangelism, if you are not relationally walking beside people, um, it's not about people getting a ticket to heaven, right? Jesus made disciples. It's about hanging in there for the relationship. And so I said, so you're go tell, tell me how this looks. You're going under a bridge where somebody has been for 10 years who doesn't trust people and the first thing you say is Jesus loves you. Like, that's kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah, pretty much. And we want to tell them about the gospel. And I'm like, okay. And I said, <clears throat> obviously you're asking the question because you're struggling with that. And the one guy was a retired psychologist who, he was a professor, I think, at Geneva College. So he was a very well-respected professor. And he said, well, Colleen, I have a different way. And I said, well, will you tell me your way? And he said, well, I just want to go sit with them and hear their story. I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. And I said, tell me how you would start that conversation. He goes, well, I would sit down and I would admit as an older white man, um, like I have no idea what it's like to be homeless. I know, I have no idea what it's like to be addicted. I have no idea. And so he's going through like 10 things that quite frankly are stereotypes of the homeless. And and I said, okay, so you have no relationship with this person, but you're going to sit down. He goes, yeah, wouldn't that be a better way than thumping the Bible at him? Like, because I was called thumping the Bible. And I said, no, that's horrible. Like, that is, that's horrible. And I understand that it makes sense to you, but let's think about this. I said, you're asking people for very personal pieces of themselves. So if you walk into your cell group or whoever your close group of circles is, and somebody says to you, tell us everything about your life. Like, tell us even, you know, have you ever been sexually molested? Have you ever, blah, 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 blah. Would you not run away from those people? Yeah, that would be totally inappropriate. I said, well, we're all human beings. It's totally inappropriate for anyone. I said, the other thing is the assumptions that you're making, you know, I've never been drug addicted. I said, you are putting a whole lot of stuff on without having a clue why they're sitting there under the bridge for 10 years. I, if I was that person, I would be so offended. And I said, you will block them from conversations for a lot longer. Well, Colleen, what would you do if the person was under the bridge? I said, I would just start to be present. And sometimes I probably would sit a little distance away and just physically be present. And eventually, you know, I would see if I could say hi, if they wanted to talk. I would look at a practical need. I would carry water all the time because you're in Dallas and it's very hot. And I would say, D do you need some water? I brought some extra water. Is there anything else that you need? You know, and I said I would develop a relationship. And I would be clear at times because God is a part of everything that I am that eventually they would be like, why are you being so nice or, you know, and then you can share that God has called you because he really loves you and he really loves them. And you just want to be available for them. And if they don't bite and ask more questions, provide for their physical need and do it for years because what it takes to develop a relationship and even have permission to be a part of people's lives can be a very long time.